What is the most important part of an intermittent fasting regimen? Believe it or not, it's not the actual fasting part, it's how you break a fast. When you break your fast, your body is sensitive and it's ready to absorb whatever you give it, good, bad, or ugly. You have the potential to build a lot of muscle or store a lot of fat at the end of an intermittent fasting day. So let's talk about how to break it, but for women. You see, I've noticed that there's a huge void out there when it comes down to information for women and intermittent fasting. Now, truth be told, there's not a whole lot of things that we have to change in terms of breaking a fast for women versus men, but there are some very important little things that I would recommend. So we're gonna touch on them. So a lot of this is gonna overlap what I would suggest for men, but there's going to be specific pieces that I think are gonna truly help women, especially when it comes down to hormones and thyroid, okay? So we're gonna talk about all that. So let's go ahead and let's dive right in. But first, make sure you hit that red subscribe button and then hit that little bell icon so you can turn on notifications. Let's go ahead and let's dive into this. It's easier to start with what you should avoid than what you should eat because quite frankly, what you should eat is gonna be pretty simple and you'll see as I go through this video. Okay, the main things that we wanna avoid. First of all, we wanna avoid what are called fructans and galacto-oligosaccharides. Now before you turn off this video because you think I'm gonna go super in-depth in the science, I just had to start off with some fun $10 words. Okay, all those mean are that those are types of things that don't break down easily. So we're talking about garlic, we're talking about onions, we're talking about specific kind of fruit tans like an inulin, things like that. So the point is, is don't use garlic and onion and don't use seasonings that have garlic and onion. Don't even use garlic powder or onion powder. Why? Because they don't digest in the small intestine. They go straight down into the colon and they ferment. Normally not a huge deal because that's a prebiotic fiber, right? But at the end of a fast, that causes sort of a redirect. So your body is not working on absorbing the nutrients. It's working more on drawing water and attention and fermentation down to the colon. So keep it clean, keep it simple. You want to assimilate whatever you take in right out the gate. Now, the other thing is you don't want to be having any kind of uh, prebiotic fibers, right? So we're talking about the things like asparagus. We're talking about any fibers, honestly, you kind of want to keep out of the equation, especially prebiotic ones. So artichokes, asparagus, stuff like that. Here's why. When you are intermittent fasting, your gut biome sort of resets back to ground zero, which is a great thing, but it looks like this. You have your bad bacteria here and you have your good bacteria here. And more than likely, I hate to say it, your bad bacteria is probably elevated. So when you fast, everything kind of comes back down, okay? But you still have a higher ratio of bad bacteria to good bacteria. So what happens is when you eat prebiotic fiber, which is its job is to fertilize and grow existing bacteria in your gut, it's going to grow the bad bacteria more because you already have more of it. So it's feeding what you have, and if you have more, it's gonna feed that one more. So what happens is you can actually cause gut dysbiosis. So when you break your fast, you actually wanna avoid those veggies because you wanna just bring it down with simple proteins and things like that so that eventually everything just balances back out. And then once you've been fasting for a while, you can have a little bit more flexibility of adding those veggies in. But quite frankly, on a fasting day, within the first couple hours of breaking your fast, you shouldn't be having those veggies. The other important thing to note is dairy. It's very easy to wanna to just consume a whey protein shake at the end of a fast because it's easy and it gets in your system. And I, I commend you for it because it's controlled and I appreciate that. But dairy causes some pretty big surges of acid in the body. In fact, the Annals of Internal Medicine published a study that found when they took a look at people that had ulcers and people that didn't, uh, when they had dairy, there was a much higher prevalence of acid because the protein and the calcium in dairy ends up causing a big surge of acid. You don't want that from a digestive benefit, but more importantly, we don't want the inflammatory effect. Remember, you're sensitive at the end of a fast. Dairy, as much as we might love it, is inflammatory. We have to accept that. So when we consume dairy at the end of a fast, we put ourselves in a highly inflammatory state, which is a stark contrast to the highly anti-inflammatory state that we're in when we're fasting. Why would we want to ruin it? So just save the dairy for later, or just don't even do it at all on an intermittent fasting day. Trust me, you'll live without it. The other things you want to be careful of, again, it kind of roops back into the veggies, is going to be the cruciferous vegetables. You can have those, but I want you to have those two hours after you break your fast. Okay, everything will make sense when I put it all together. Cruciferous vegetables are hard to break down generally, and they also have something called raffinose in them. Raffinose is a sugar that breaks down very strangely in the body and causes you to be bloated. So let's just avoid that. Lastly, when you break your fast, avoid combining fats and carbs at all costs. I don't care if you are keto, I don't care if you're not keto. Fats and carbs together are not the answer, especially when you break a fast. Here's what happens. Okay, carbs spike your insulin, and insulin causes the cell doorway to open, and that means that nutrients can come in. 
if you spike your insulin with carbohydrates and you consume fats at the same time, guess what happens? The cell opens and the carbs come in, but guess what? So does fat. It goes right in, gets gobbled up in the cell and goes to storage. This is exacerbated after a fast. It's exacerbated because you're super insulin sensitive. You haven't eaten. So as soon as you eat something, your body's like gobble, 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 and it wants to eat it. And you're combining fats and carbohydrates. The other thing we have to look at is something known as acylation stimulating protein, which is indirectly increased by consuming fat. So when we consume fat in an insulin sensitive state, we increase ASP. This ASP causes an insulin spike. So we get a double insulin spike, which means double fat storage. Case in point, you should be keeping it just lean protein. I'll give you the full protocol in just a minute. I have to explain something that's very important for women now. It is super important for women that you have a cortisol mitigation strategy prior to breaking your fast. I'll say that again. It's important for men too, but really important for women because women tend to have higher levels of cortisol when they fast. It is very important that you have a cortisol mitigation strategy prior to breaking your fast. Cortisol is your best friend when it comes to fat burning, but it's also your worst enemy when it comes to fat storage. How does that make sense? Cortisol should be elevated while you're fasting. Cortisol should be elevated because it causes you to burn fat, but cortisol should not be elevated in combination with food. When cortisol is elevated in conjunction with food is when it causes storage. Glucocorticoid receptors in our belly fat causes us to store fat right in our belly when we eat when cortisol is high. Because your cortisol is high when you're fasting, you don't want to break your fast with your cortisol levels being high. Because guess what? The food you eat is going to go to storage. So what do we do? We have protocols. First and foremost is lifestyle protocols. Okay, this is separate and aside. You probably should get in the practice of doing some deep breathing, some meditation, some yoga, or something to bring your cortisol levels down. But let's make this nutrition oriented. Have a little bit of salt. Or actually, have a lot of salt. Start adding salt to your water a couple hours before you break a fast. Okay, some people like to have bone broth right before they break a fast, and that's great too, because it solves the same purpose. Uh, but it does technically break a fast, so you'd want to have your bone broth closer to the end of your fast. But otherwise, just add some salt to your water. Add a couple teaspoons, get a good amount. Salt is going to back off the production of what's called aldosterone. Okay, aldosterone is something that regulates fluid retention and salt retention in the body. If we add some salt, aldosterone can decrease, which, believe it or not, aldosterone and cortisol synergistically work together. So if we have salt, aldosterone can drop, and therefore cortisol drops. Okay, not significantly, but enough to help us out. The next piece we have to look at is add a little bit of cinnamon. Okay, cinnamon, some will say it breaks a fast. I honestly say it doesn't. Add some cinnamon to a glass of water, warm water, whatever. Have some cinnamon tea. What cinnamon is going to do is it is going to moderate your cortisol levels, but it's also going to make it so that your blood sugar is a little bit lower. You see, it's interesting. Cinnamon does something known as uh, it, it mimics insulin. So it makes it so that the cells open up as if you had insulin in the system, but you don't. So you get all the benefits of consuming carbs as far as the cell opening up, but without actually consuming carbs. Okay, so it makes life really, really easy for you. It does this through something known as methyl hydroxy chalcone polymer, which doesn't really matter. Another just like expensive word that I like to throw around, but all it is is basically the way that cinnamon acts upon the cells. So it's really cool. So do that like an hour or so before you break a fast and you're gonna be in a good spot. Your cortisol levels are gonna be a little bit lower. So now let's talk about what you should do when you're actually breaking the fast. Now I'm gonna give you some specific protocols for your thyroid and everything like that, but the first big meat and potatoes, for lack of a better term, of this whole thing is you should really only be consuming lean protein predominantly from a fish source. Okay, predominantly even better from a shellfish source. Take it or leave it, like it or love it, this is where the science points. It's just easy. White fish that is lean, like a halibut or a cod or maybe even a haddock or possibly even a Chilean sea bass or something like that, if you can get a clean one, is really, really good. Even better would be like some scallops or would be some mussels or would be some shrimp. I'll explain in a second. Okay, if you can't do that, which I understand you cannot always, a lean protein shake from pea, not from whey. Very important it's not from whey. We don't want the inflammatory effects. So fish or a pea protein shake is going to be the ultimate best. Next up, third place is gonna be a lean chicken, lean uh, white meat, no added fats. If you need a recommendation on the pea protein, highly, highly recommend Sun Warriors Warrior Blend. So it works well if you're keto or if you're not keto and they've taken pea protein and combined it with a little bit of hemp, so you actually get a full spectrum, complete 
amino acid profile, all nine aminos, but they also have some other things in there to round out the antioxidant profile. So it ends up being really good for breaking a fast. In fact, that's what I do a lot of times, even as a male. Now, it would work probably even better for a female in this case. So just so you know, there is a special link down below in the description if you want to take me up on that recommendation. Highly do recommend it. It's great whether you're keto, fasting, whatever you're doing. And plus a special discount for those of you that watch my videos. So can't beat that. Okay, the reason I prefer having some shellfish, and again, if you can't have shellfish, go ahead and just add these minerals in, is because you're going to get zinc. Women are much more prone to hypothyroidism. Okay, so at the end of a fast, your thyroid activity suppresses a little bit. It's normal. You're not eating, so of course your thyroid activity is going to suppress, but it will come back to normal, but let's take some extra precaution to take care of the thyroid. What does zinc do? Zinc doesn't affect the thyroid itself. Zinc affects thyroid receptors in the cells. If we have adequate amounts of zinc, then the cells can utilize the thyroid hormone that's available better, meaning we could effectively get by with less thyroid hormone because our cells are utilizing it better. So right at the end of a fast, this is exactly what we want. Thyroid levels are lower, so let's increase the cell's affinity for it. So we actually keep our metabolism revved up nice and hot. Again, men can benefit from this too, but I feel like it's important for women. So add a small amount of zinc, maybe 33 milligrams, 25 to 33 milligrams, kind of the tabs you see. That's fine, just get something like that. But preferentially, you'd wanna be eating a little bit of shellfish. You can even have a protein shake with like a couple oysters or something. I, I know it's gross for some people, so I understand if you're just grossed out by that. Okay, next up, iodine. We need to do what we can to get some iodine in. And the way that I do that is if I am gonna cook up some meat or if I am gonna do something, I will have a little bit of like a seasoning that has some kelp or seaweed in it. Like, believe it or not, they're out there all the time. Just make sure they don't have the onion or the garlic, okay? Or get some seaweed flakes or some nori or some seaweed snacks, crumple them up and put them on your fish, put them on your oysters, put them on whatever, or just eat a couple seaweed snacks that don't have a bunch of oil in them along with your protein shake. Pretty simple, right? Now the big thing, on any day that you fast, okay, any day at all, okay, doesn't mean breaking your fast, it means the whole time of the day that you're fasting, you should not consume any gluten. Now, if you're keto, this isn't gonna be an issue because you shouldn't be consuming gluten anyway unless you're getting it small amounts from soy, soy sauce or something. On a day you fast, do not consume any gluten. It's something called molecular mimicry. When we consume gluten, what happens is this. Our body upregulates a protein known as zonulin. And this zonulin protein causes us to have a little bit of a leaky gut. And this leaky gut makes it so that larger molecules of protein and different things get into the bloodstream, which triggers a specific kind of immune response. Well, these antibodies that are designed to attack the zonulin response also cross-pollinate and attack the thyroid tissue. This is called molecular mimicry because the thyroid tissue looks so similar to some of these things that the antibodies are attacking that it actually attacks the thyroid and slows it down, slowing down your metabolism and potentially leading to some disease states that we really wanna be careful of, right? Hashimoto, other, other um, even Graves' disease, things like that. We have to be careful with these things. We don't have answers entirely what's causing them, but we do know some of these things that affect them. So very, very important there. So case in point with this is, your break fast meal should look so simple. A little bit of bone broth or a little bit of salt before, okay, some cinnamon and some cinnamon, and then break your fast with lean protein. I would recommend something pretty simple. If you're uh, 100 pounds or less, do about three ounces. If you're 100 pounds to 150 pounds, do four to five ounces of lean protein. If you're 150 to 200 pounds, six ounces, and if over 200 pounds, probably no more than seven ounces. We just kind of cap it there because it's a lot to break down no matter how much you weigh, okay? Then a couple hours later, that's when you can have a little bit more enjoyment, a little bit more flexibility with your meals. What's important is that little two hour window right before you break your fast, when you break your fast, and an hour after you break your fast. Okay, that whole window is the most important. Now I can expand a lot more, but you have to understand there's a lot that goes into this and a lot of different moving pieces. So if you post your comments down below and you try to generalize them into what would be a helpful video, uh, something that's a big enough video for me to produce, I can look at that and I can evaluate if it's a good video to do. So as always, make sure you're keeping it locked in here on my channel. Make sure you check out Sun Warrior down below in the description. And thank you again for watching. See you soon.